Heavenly Father, um, it's an honor to, to come here again tonight and worship you and praise you and, and listen to your word proclaimed, Father. So I just pray for the service, um, the worship, the music, that it will honor you and glorify you, um, that the fellowship would, would also uh, focus on you, Father, and, and grow us and edify us, and that you would be with Brian as he proclaims your, your word and truth, um, that he'll have boldness in, in the proclamation of your word. Um, that you'll guide him through your Holy Spirit and illuminate the the word uh, for us, Father, tonight. So just ask you to, to bless us all. Um, in Jesus' name, amen.
all you weary, and I will give you Captives free, 
All because of your love All because of your love Lord, you gave your life for me And I will give my life to you All because of your love All because of your love Because of your cross My debt is paid Because of your blood My sins are washed away Now all of my life I freely give Freely give Because of your love Because of your love I You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. Yeah, you did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Freely give. Because of your love, because of your love, because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Freely give. Because of your love, because of your love, I. I freely give, freely give Because of your love, because of your love Because of your cross, my debt is paid Because of your blood, all my sins are washed away Now all of my life, I freely give Because of your love, because of your love I live Well, guys, um, I decided I'm going to share my testimony this evening, which some of you have heard bits and pieces of, but it's just to bring encouragement to you guys out there. And um, But I'd like to begin with a Bible reading in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, and verse 8 is... Uh, a verse that I'd like to read. Actually, I read verse, verse, um, yeah, verse eight, verse seven, eight, and nine. Um, these are days we need to be strong spiritually and to have courage with the things that we're facing individually, personally, and we need spiritual strength. And um, we're provided an instruction here in Joshua 1. This was obviously written to Joshua um, when he's taken over Moses. Yet, we can also take courage in these words tonight and realize that if we're going to be strong spiritually, then our strength is found in the Word of God, in the Scriptures. And it's really important that we saturate ourselves in the Word because our minds and our hearts really need that for protection, to preserve us, to keep us. And uh, the enemy wants our mind, you know, whether it be through entertainment things or whether it just be through oppression and harassment. So it's really important that we fill our minds with the Word of God. And here... Um, Joshua 1, it says, Be strong and of good courage. Um, well, I, 
I'll read verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. <clears throat> this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, why am I reading that out when I'm sharing my testimony with you? Well, the reason for that is because um, before I came to Jesus, I was oppressed, as many of you know. I was oppressed demonically. I was oppressed spiritually. And I didn't know <clears throat> about spiritual things. I didn't know that those things were real. I was 18 years old when I became a believer. But before I became a believer, um, I had voices in my head, demonic voices in my head. Uh, one night in my kitchen, all hell broke loose literally in my life, where it felt like invisible forces were coming against me. And um, during that moment of fear, my sister says that I was rolling around on the floor holding my head, and she said, Brian, what's wrong? And I just told her, I said, the devil is trying to destroy me. So she ran upstairs, she had a good news Bible, and she ran upstairs and gave me the Bible. And I can remember, at that point, my theology, or my understanding was, if the devil is real, then God must be real too. Because the Bible talks about, you know, the devil. So I began to open the Bible. And uh, like any other book, I started right at the beginning. There were no Christians around at that point who could guide me, who could say, Brian, go, go to the Gospel of John, <laughs> you know. Um, I didn't know any Christians if there were any around. Where I lived... It was called the race course estate, and there was a lot of sin there. There was a lot of uh, alcoholism, a lot of drugs. Never did the hard stuff, but I certainly smoked my first share of marijuana. And there was mass unemployment. This was the days of Margaret Thatcher, not holding it against her when I say that. But we just didn't have any jobs. So our whole life consisted of um, every two weeks getting our unemployment check, and then going to our marijuana Jamaican dealer, still remember his name, Donald was his name, and uh, we would uh, get our fix. Sometimes we'd just go out and get drunk, listen to music, rock music at the time, and, and that, that was our whole life, and our whole life was empty. But when that night happened to me, when that night occurred to me, it rearranged my whole life because I had never read the Bible before and I'd never really searched for God before. But going through that miserable experience drove me to the Bible. It drove me to God. And looking back, it, that's what it took to bring me to God. Now, I'm not saying that God sent that to me, but I am saying that God permitted it to happen to me because he knew that that would be the avenue through which he would cause me to seek his face. So I began to read the Bible, <clears throat> and I didn't really know the Bible very well, but I started in Genesis, and Genesis made sense to me because all of a sudden I'm confronted and I've Thank God that the book of Genesis is put first in the Bible because immediately we're confronted with the reality that God is the creator and he created us and it really blew the lie that I was learning in school, which I never believed in anyway, that we came from apes. You know, we learned that in 
a class called Humanities is what it was called. Never believed it. But the Bible made more sense to me. And it was like as I was reading the Bible, even through that state of confusion, the truth of God's word rang home. It was like God was there. Somebody once said that the Bible is the only book whose author is always present when someone reads it. And it's true. So in the midst of all this chaos going on in my life, in the midst of all this demonic stuff going on in my life, underneath all that, it just felt like there was a quiet presence that was guiding me to salvation. And um, I didn't know who God was. I knew of God, but I didn't, I was afraid of God. But I can remember repenting of my, or trying to repent of my sin. I, I can remember um, all my sin coming open before me, and I thought, these things are happening to me because of the sin that's in my life. Now, there was something of a connection there with the demonic oppression and the sins that I was engaged in were opening the door for that to happen, if that makes sense. I won't go into excessive detail, but we even lived in a haunted house. And I could tell you all kinds of weird stories about weird spiritual events that took place in my home at that point. Put the heebie-jeebies in you, you know. And I couldn't sleep at night in that home until I became a believer. And um, I won't go into excessive detail about some of this stuff, but I even tried to commit suicide. I felt driven to try to commit suicide. I found a bunch of pills that belonged to my mom, and I took them all. Well, we can laugh about it now because they turned out to be water pills. But, uh, <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time emptying my bladder. And even my mom laughed about it after the fact, after I was healed by the Lord, you know, and cured by the Lord. But at the time, my family was deeply concerned for me because I was mentally oppressed. I was mentally harassed. And I had an understanding. It was, it was interesting looking back. It was like an intuitive, intuitive sense that the answer was in the Bible. So I kept reading the Bible. Kept reading the Bible. Kept reading the Bible. <laughs> to the point that my family was very concerned for me. But I had nothing else to do. And the voices wouldn't leave me alone. In fact... The voices would even tell me, if you read that Bible, we're going to kill you. And I thought they had the power to do that. And um, if I knew one thing, the enemy, which were the voices coming against me, they wanted to keep me out of the Bible, keep me out of the Word. Because they realized, oh, if he stays in that Word long enough, we know the power of that Word. We've been on the receiving end of some of that, you know. And there were times of deep discouragement, times of deep failure, times of deep despair. But something kept telling me the answer was in the Word. And over a few months period, I had a dog that I would take out for walks. And the farm rode behind me. And this is a true story about another individual who I knew. I could even tell you his name, but I won't tell you his name. But uh, the same individual, the same individual was going through what I went through, voices in his head. He worked with my older brother. And um, he walked that same road, and he poured gasoline over himself and set fire to himself and committed suicide. On that same farm road where that man committed suicide, and that was, he did that after I got saved there. On that same farm road where I'm walking my dog, I'm crying out to God under the oppression God, if you're there, save me. God, if you're there, come into my life. Just crying out. And when I did that, these waves and waves of love were poured out all over me and I was instantly set free. 
It was like these, these waves and waves of perfect love were poured into my heart. And it was like what was going through my mind at that point was this is everything I've ever searched for and didn't realize it. And I can remember being surprised in my mind that you mean the answer really has been God all along? And for the first time in my life, I cried tears of joy. And there was warmth all over me. And I ran home because I still lived at home. And I told my mom, Mom, I've just had an experience with God. And she said, you look a little different. Was that the end of my problems? No. I believe at that particular moment, I had gotten saved. I believed at that particular moment, the Lord regenerated my spirit, regenerated my soul. And for the first time in my life, I was reading the Bible because I wanted to, not because I had to. I was seeking God because I loved Him. Where before, I didn't love Him. But I could say I loved Him because He first loved me. For the first time in my life, I had an understanding that if God could love me at my worst, then He would never ever quit loving me ever again. Because I was at my very worst. I was riddled with all kinds of sin, all kinds of evil in my heart. And God poured His love into my life. And it was such a perfect love. It was such a liberating love. It was such a forgiving love that I never, ever wanted to go back and do those things ever again. I'm not saying that when that occurrence happened, I never sinned again because we all stumble, we all fall. But at that moment, I realized, wow, this is what life really is. The answer is God. Now, my whole attitude towards God changed because God loved me. Turn with me to 1 John 4. 1 John 4. So I just want to encourage you tonight that if you're waiting on God to set you free, like I was, stay in the Word. Stay in the Bible. The answer is in the Word of God. There was a lady who told me, the mind is the devil's playground. And I'm sure you've all heard that, right? So I thought, well, if my mind is the devil's playground, I'm going to fill my mind with the Word of God. And I want to fill my mind with the Word of God to such a degree that he won't want to hang around in my mind anymore. And he doesn't give up easily. Oppressions don't get broken easily. There are things in our Christian life which are called strongholds. And even after I was delivered on the farm road, the enemy tried to come back and tried to harass me. At that point, I wasn't going to church. I didn't know I was even supposed to go to church. And I'll share that with you in a moment, how I ended up at church. The one thing I will say is we do need other believers in our life. We need the strength and the encouragement of other believers. For one thing, we're called into a discipleship realm. And discipleship is where we're learning what Jesus has commanded us. It's like, okay, we are now saved. How shall, they, how shall we then live, right? And we're called to be a part of a body of believers. And even though... At that point, I wasn't physically connected with a church. I was spiritually connected to the church because I had been baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. I just needed to find that connection. The beautiful thing is God can make those connections happen in the oddest ways. 1 John 4, turn with me there. 1 John 4. See, I didn't know this was in the Bible when that happened to me on the farm road. But 1 John 4 and 
verse 17. Well, I read, let's see, verse 17, maybe verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. That's true. If we can describe God in three words, God is love. If I encountered anything on that farm road that day, I encountered the most powerful love you could ever imagine in your life. It was deeper than any love I'd ever known. It was a love that would love me even in the condition I was in. And it was a love that set me free. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. How do we know that on the day of judgment we're going to pass God's wrath? Well, as I pointed out to you, when God loved me in my worst moment, it's such a love that you realize it's a love that will never let you go. It's a love that will never condemn you again. It is a love that disciplines and corrects, yes. But it's not a love that will ever pour wrath out on you. Because once he sets his love on you, that will be for all eternity. He will not let you go. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, 1 John 4, 18, I was a very fearful person. I was bound by fear, especially in relation to God. Here's the problem we have, and here's the problem I had, is I was aware of my sin, and I'm trying to come to God, but I'm afraid of him at the same time. Because I know God is holy, and I'm a sinner, and therefore, you know, the things I've done in life have been against his law, against him. I've offended him. And I realize I didn't deserve God's love. But grace is the answer to all of that, isn't it? Grace is the answer. And here, when it talks about verse 18, there is no fear in love. When God loves you, you're no longer afraid of him in the wrong sense. Yes, there's a reverential fear, don't get me wrong, where you realize he's God and we're not and he's got all the power and, and he deserves our respect. There's a difference there. Sometimes the Bible uses the word fear in reverential tones, you know. But the kind of fear here is dealing with torment. That when you think about God, you're tormented at the thought of God because you realize that you've lived against him, therefore he's going to judge you. When he sets his love on you, he removes that torment from your life. Where you realize, if he could love me at my worst, then he'll always love me for all eternity. And by the way, you really won't believe at that point that you could lose your salvation. <laughs> My friend, if you could lose your salvation, then God made a mistake by setting His love on you. Because once God sets His love on you, He's not going to unset that love on you. He's not that kind of God. You say, well, what about me? I have my ins and outs. Well, don't you think God knows that? Are your ins and outs more powerful than God's love for you? Sometimes we leave our first love and God calls us back in repentance. But he'll never let you go. There is no fear in love. Not God's love. But perfect love casts out fear. One translation says all fear. I had a tremendous problem with fear. A lot of mental illnesses are based on fear. You know that? And guilt. Guilt. 
what I found in my own life is I could only put so much under the carpet and then it began to stink. And I was afraid of people finding out what I put under the carpet. You know what I mean? So do you know what that produced in my life? Paranoia. I was paranoid. I didn't want people to find out what I was doing in my own privacy, what I was doing in my own heart. And I was afraid that people would find out what kind of person I was and then permanently discard me and have nothing to do with me. Paranoia. So, so do you know what I did? I isolated myself. Oh, but when God loved me, he broke the prison of shame. He broke the prison of guilt. He broke the prison of fear. He broke the prison of the fear of God's wrath. And he brought me into a relationship with himself where I wasn't reading the Bible just to get delivered from the voices. I was reading the Bible because I loved the God who set his love on me. Perfect, his perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. In other words, if we still have torment when we're thinking of God, you have not yet encountered the love of God as yet. The cure for that is to know that God loves you and know that God will forgive you if you ask him to forgive you tonight. Now verse 19 says this, we love him because he first loved us. In other words, I can honestly say with every fiber of my being, I did not love God. I was afraid of him. I was scared of him. How can you love someone you don't know? I didn't know him. The only thing I knew about him was I've sinned against him. I've lived a life of sin. And um, I felt like God's punishing me by sending these voices into my life and tormenting me. And I felt like this is what I deserve. I deserve to be tormented for the rest of my life because of what I've done and who I've been. And so I was alienated from the... And, and yet something in me kept saying, the answer's in the Bible. So I kept reading the Bible. The voices in my head hated the Bible. So I realized, well, there must be something good in it then. And I was pursuing him... And trying to repent, trying to give up my sin without being able to do it. Oh, but when he put his love in my heart, that's what set me free. When he loved me, I loved him for the very first time. No human being ever loves God without God first loving them. That's true. We love him because he first Love does. So at that point, I was set free. But voices still happened. I was alone. I needed Christian companionship. I needed a church of brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, one night, a church knocked on my door. It was a Wednesday evening. And I wasn't home. And uh, they invited my mom to church. And my mom, she threw me under the bus instead. <laughs> my mom said, and my mom always liked Christians. She said, she used to say there was, I don't like those JWs, but I do like those Christians. And I didn't realize this, but my mom used to go to church. Um, she had a friend that came to Christ and her life was revolutionized, and she saw the transformation in my friend's life. And she went to church, but my dad, who was alcoholic, was very controlling and very jealous and wanted my wife, my, my mom, always at home. And so he accused her of liking the pastor or something, you know, and wanting to you know, have an affair with the pastor. And so she quit going. But she always kept that faith in her heart, you know. So... When I started reading the Bible and, and, the, and these two Christians knocked on my door, my mom knew that going to church was a good thing. 
So she said, oh, I've got a son who reads the Bible. He'll go to church with you. <laughs> and so I came home. And you've got to understand this. Even though I'd been delivered from schizophrenia, I was still struggling. Because even after you're delivered from what the world calls schizophrenia, you've still got a lot of pictures in your mind. You've still got a lot of attitudes in your mind. And I had become a loner at that point. I didn't want to be around people. I was paranoid, you know. So when I came home, my mom said, oh, you're going to church Wednesday. I'm like, really? I don't want to go to church. <laughs> but I went. These strangers picked me up. They brought me into church. It was a charismatic church, non-denominational. And I can remember Wednesday night, it was like a praise and worship service. And as I go in, I felt the presence of God. Um, at that point, God was ministering to me in a real strong way because I really needed it badly. And so I had, as I walked into the building, not that I based my faith on this, but God was giving me this because of how, how badly I needed it. I had tingles all over me. Like God was present in this place. And they were singing my experience, which I found very odd. And I just knew I was in the right place. Now, here's a word of warning. You're never going to find a perfect church, ever. They're not out there. They don't exist. I used to think for the first few months that I went there, man, these people are so perfect. And then I realized after I tested their patience. No, they're not perfect. <laughs> they, they, they're still human as well. But there were two men in particular who took me under their wing. There was a preacher there who was slightly older than me, about 10 years older than me, and he drove me around and would minister to me. And he kind of went off the rails a little bit and tried to give me some false doctrine that he was picking up. But there was a much older man who really meant more to me than anything else. And he um, had the gift of hospitality. He was a retired man. And George was his name, real interesting character. And he would invite me around his house. To step into his house was like going back in time. There was no TV. All he had was a radio. He gave up on TVs because he said the TVs caused him to backslide. So he gave them up, you know. And we would sit around and we would read and he was, you know, I really looked out because he was a chef as well and he used to feed me. And people would come around that man's house completely unannounced. But that man would disciple me. That man would rebuke me when I needed it. And trust me, I needed it a lot. Um, as I shared with you one time, I, I picked up this false doctrine in my mind and I shared this idea with him that we were now fully, you know, in perfection. I was reading Romans 8 about the manifestation of the sons of God. And I said, you know, we're now sons of God. And the enemy was tricking me. He was uh, deceiving me with passages in the Bible. And all this man got up. He just got up and he prayed and he cried and he wept. And he said, Lord, deliver my brother. And I, I felt his tears land on my head. <laughs> And guess what? That delivered me. <laughs> I'm like, whoops, I guess I've been teaching something not right here and been deceived. And um, he really helped me a lot. But um, as I was going to church, I felt called to preach and stuff. And uh, I didn't do very well at it. Still don't do very well at it. But um, I just felt a call that the God who saved me had a purpose for my life. And after going to this church for four years, I, I, I kept going to the pastor. I said, you know, I feel called to go to Bible college. And he would tell me, no, I think you should stay here. And uh, I even had people tell me, you're not called to preach. You're just called to share your testimony, you know because you had such an unusual testimony. So, but the call wouldn't leave me alone. I can remember feeling called to go to Bible college, and the very Bible college I was called to was in Scotland, and, and I loved it there when I did go. But I was hearing some negative stories about this place, 
about how cold it was, um, how bad the food was. So I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to go to Doncaster instead. So what I tried to do, I tried to put my own interpretation on God's will. Has anyone else ever tried to do that? Okay, you want me to go to Bible college? I'm going to go to this one. And I picked a very professional place, very respectable place. And I went down and I got accepted. And so everyone thought I was leaving. And they even had a little get together for me. And I've been reading all those stories, you know, testimonials about if God wants you somewhere, he'll give you the finance to go. We've all read those, haven't we? Well, it, it didn't happen for me. <laughs> and so next week, I think the church thought they might have gotten rid of me. I show back up. Like, oh, we thought you were leaving. It's like, well, the money didn't come. And finally, God broke me to the point that I finally says, okay, I'll go to Scotland. So I went to Scotland. And after being there a year, um, there was a teaching opening that opened up, and I was asked to teach classes, and so I began to teach classes. After being there a year, my wife shows up as well, uh, his daughter, Delena. And uh, as you know, she's American. And... Women often know stuff before we do, Gordon. Um, I don't know if you've ever found that out. But when my wife met me, she says, well, as soon as she met me, she knew she was going to marry me. How does a woman know that? <laughs> I mean, come on. And I remember Mrs. Cameron, she said to me one time, she says, you're going to marry that woman. And at that time, Delaney and I weren't dating. And I just said, not in a million years. And she laughed with a Scottish laugh, and she said, you've just sealed your fate. <laughs> and by golly, was she right. So then, I began to sense a call to get married and to come out here, but as many of you know, I did resist it, right? And uh, they didn't know if I was coming or not. Um, I was afraid. Not only was I afraid of getting married, I was afraid of changing countries. And um, God has ways of dealing with you. Um, as I'm messing with this, finally, my fiance at the time, she said to me, I don't care what you're doing, I'm going home. And if you choose to come, great. If not, then that's fine too. She finally had enough of my indecisiveness. So right as I'm struggling with this, I'm asking God, I said, God, give me a sign. Kind of like that cartoon, you know. Um, here I am, sign coming down, one of those BC funny signs that happened. Um, and we were at a convention, and a convention is where preachers come in and preach. And there was a preacher and here I am struggling, and I'm praying, God, show me what I'm supposed to do. Because I had America facing me, and I had the decision to come to America and get married. If getting married wasn't scary enough, changing countries, very scary, big step. Now, the preacher gets up, and he doesn't know what I'm going through. He doesn't have a clue. But he preached about Joshua crossing the Jordan. Isn't that God wonderful? And that preacher is saying, that river is not going to open up until you take the step. To take the step. And it was like he was preaching right at me. That very scripture. So, I take the step. I get my visa in London. Right before I get my visa, which would extend my stay here long enough to get married, I had people filling me with all kinds of horror stories, you know, about people who wanted to come to America, and it all failed. And I, there was someone in leadership who said, what are you going to do if you can't get your visa? And I just told him, I said, well, then it wouldn't be the will of God, would it? So I remember, with those stories still fresh in my mind, going into the London embassy 
in Ameri the, the American embassy in London and getting a visa. And I can remember being afraid. And this person was saying to me, who I never knew before, oh, you're going to get it. It'll be great. So I go up and, yep, I, I get the visa. Then I come to America. I marry my wife. And we have four children, obviously. And uh, been in this particular church for 20 years. But God's not done with us yet, you know. And um, if God wants us to stay here till our last day on earth, then hallelujah, that's what we'll do. But who knows where God's going to lead you. So a brief testimony, and I just want to encourage you that um, God is more powerful than the voices. Now, let me give you another verse. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. I was a very fearful person, and I was afraid of crowds. I had a terrible stammer because of the fears that I had. And this verse was a verse that the Lord would use very often to um, comfort me. This was a verse I carried with me with the fears I had. And there was, you know, that some of the wiser believers around me, they would encourage me. They would say, take a verse, carry it with you throughout the day. Let that be, well, whatever verse it is that, that, that speaks to you, that comforts you, that encourages you. So I can remember standing in the crowd, being afraid as I'm waiting my turn to give a particular order or something and thinking about this verse. And this verse really helped me, really encouraged me to overcome the fear. And this verse here, it says, um, For God, 2 Timothy 1.7 for God has not given us a spirit of fear, is not good news, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Notice the third part, sound mind. When you walk in love and you focus on the love of God to you, you know what that does? It causes you to think soundly. When you you see, the, the biggest battle we go through as believers, I believe, is in our mind. Um, where the enemy assaults us is in our mind. And when you focus on the love of God for you, the Bible says the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul. And then the New Testament says strength. Um, focus on God. Who you love, you will think about the most, right? We think if you love your wife, you will think about your wife. If you love your children, you will think about your children. But if you love God, you'll think about God. And that will deliver your mind and set your mind free. One of the battles we go through, and this is the battle I went through, when you go through demonic oppression like that, the enemy wants the whole attention. He wants you to focus on demonic stuff all the time. But we're not, we're not supposed to do that. Focus on the Lord. Focus on Jesus. Focus on God. And as you focus on God, whatever you focus on, that's what you're going to get, right? That will be your, your view. And so don't let the enemy obsess in your mind to that degree where you become obsessed with thinking about him all the time because the Bible says don't give the enemy any place, right? Don't give him that place in your mind. Think about God. Love God. Focus on him. The thing about fear is it causes you to think on that which you really don't want to think about, but it's so obsessive that it's a constant repetition in your mind. But love is greater than that fear. So focus on the love of God. And don't think about the enemy all the time because he likes that kind of attention. Focus on the Lord and he'll deliver you. Romans 5, let's go there. Romans 5, just a few passages here. Romans 5.
If you've put your hope in God, he will not fail you. He's the only one that won't fail you. In the midst of seeking freedom, focus on the Lord. You might be hoping for something we don't have yet. But if your hope is in Christ, he won't fail you. It says, now hope does not disappoint, Romans 5, 5. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. One translation said, shed abroad. Now, if the love of God is poured out and shed abroad in your heart, there's no room for the enemy anymore. Amen? The enemy's not going to want to stick around where someone's been filled with God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not going to share his temple with a demon. Amen? And if you're a believer, you are not possessed. You might be oppressed, but never possessed. There's a difference. Don't let the enemy lie to you with that. You belong to God. And the Holy Spirit will never share his vessel with another. And no demon will want to cohabit a vessel that's, that's, that's filled with his Holy Spirit. He's not going to want to stick around there. But as a new believer, we're vulnerable because he tries to take advantage. He tries to manipulate. And like a babe needs covering, a babe needs protection, a babe needs nurturing and feeding from its mother. And um, in a sense, we're a part of the church. And I don't want to sound weird, but the church, in a sense, is like a mother to us in that sense. Preserves, protects, keeps, nurtures. That's the job of the church, isn't it? To look after the babes in Christ. That's what we're called to do. Um, 1 John 4 was another verse that really helped me a lot. Turn with me to 1 John 4. Um, 1 John 4 was a verse that really encouraged me. And the, the longer you're in it, the longer you're in Christianity, the more you'll start to get deeper into Scripture and you'll start to reject some of the things you heard in the beginning and realize, no, I need stronger teaching. I need the Word on a greater level. You'll get hungry for that which you're feeding on. And as we grow, we'll start craving meat. How many of you got grandchildren that are babies? And when you're eating meat, they're almost like looking at the meat like, I want some of that, right? Because they've had that green stuff all along, you know? What's that? Lily don't like meat? Oh, well, she's still little. She's still little. Give her time. No. <laughs> um, 1 John 4, verse 4. In, and in context, it's talking about false teachers that are, that are guided by the Antichrist spirit. And yeah, we have two opposing issues right now. Here, here's a thought. What, what John is saying here is, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not going to be deceived by an Antichrist spirit. Because the spirit in you will rise up and warn you and protect you. He'll keep you from it. But uh, 1 John 4 verse 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Not going to, have overcome them. Uh, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that good news? We're drawing from him. Now, here's a 2 Corinthians 10. If you turn with me there, please. 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Your mind is so important. Your mind belongs to God. Your mind doesn't belong to the enemy. Every part of you as a Christian belongs to God, including your mind. The enemy is a thief, of course, and he tries to steal. 
and kill and even destroy. But the Holy Spirit protects us. He keeps us safe. The Bible says if we've been born of God, which we have, and the seed of God is in us, then the wicked one cannot harm us. Isn't that good news? It says that in 1 John. Forget the exact verse, but it says the wicked one cannot harm us. He'd like to, but he can't because you belong to God. You're protected by God. 2 Corinthians 10. How many of you know the only power the enemy really has is lies? And if you believe the lies, the lies will control your life. They will dominate your life. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. Here's a thought. Did you realize you're in a warfare as a Christian? It's a different type of warfare. It's true that we're fighting a defeated foe, but it's important that we stay under God's coverage. Um, it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. One of the most frustrating things for me when I was going through the voices and schizophrenia and everything, was I was dealing with an invisible enemy. It was like, just let me at them. <laughs> you know, just if I, if I had something, someone physical who I could touch and go out and do some fisticuffs or something, you know. But the, this was a different type of warfare. It was like invisible elements coming against you and you're like, how do I fight this? I don't know how to fight this. Well, as we get stronger in the faith and stronger in the word, we begin to learn that we don't have to put up with that. Um, it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons, plural, of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of the flesh, but they're mighty in God. My friend, the thing that gives Scripture power is that you are now connected with the God of the Scriptures. He makes these Scriptures come alive. These Scriptures are mighty in God for pulling down strong holds. And a stronghold is something that doesn't give up immediately. After I share my testimony with you, you're going to think I'm crazy. But this is what happened to me. There were times I would go to sleep at night and I'm sharing this to try and help. I would go to sleep at night and I would wake up with screaming in my ears. With something sitting on me. As I said, I, I used to live in a haunted house. It was terrible. If my family was here, they could tell you all kinds of stories about the weird things that went bump in the night in that house. And I can remember waking up and at this point I was a Christian. I'm crying out to God, God deliver me. And I shared this with another believer, and he said, just keep putting the word in you, keep putting the word in you, and it will disappear one of these days. Well, one night I woke up, and the same thing happened, screaming in my ears. And I can remember a scripture rose up within me, not here, but from the inside out. And it was like, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. And I can remember literally when that scripture came out in, in my ears, I heard a literal scream and, I, and, and that thing took off whatever it was and I never, ever had a problem again. Call me crazy if you like, but that's what I went through. <laughs> Spiritual realm is real. I know some people go nuts with it and lose the foundation of scripture and stuff like that and we go crazy. It's important we stick with the truth of Scripture because what the enemy does, he has you chase things that aren't really there. He has you chasing rabbits, you know, and going nuts with that. But stick with the Word. As I told you, focus on the Lord. Make Jesus your primary focus. Fill, fill your mind with thoughts of Him, not thoughts of the enemy. And you will overcome the enemy as you do that because the enemy doesn't want to stay in someone's mind who's in love with Jesus. <laughs> um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. A stronghold is something that doesn't give up easily. 
We, we've all had things in our life, maybe still have things in our life that we're still fighting with, we're still grappling with, and as we fight, sometimes we're tempted to give up because we're like, will I ever overcome this? Will I ever defeat this? Some of us have struggled with alcoholism, lust, different things like that. And it's a stronghold in your life. And it's like, will I ever be able to defeat this? Well, if you, if you make the stronghold your focus, probably not. But if you make Jesus your focus, yes, you will. To know that you're not alone in facing those strongholds. And just because you fall down sometimes, that doesn't mean Jesus has left you. As I pointed out to you, if he could love you so much at the beginning, he's not going to quit loving on you now. Don't face that stronghold alone. Face it with the love of God. The more you love God, the harder it is to sin against him. Isn't it? Focus on him. And at the times you do fall down, you'll get up a whole lot quicker when you make Jesus your prim primary focus. Verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What are some of the things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God? Well, it's our experience. Sometimes our experience says the opposite to what the Bible says, doesn't it? The Bible says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Is that your experience? Not always. Why? For you are not under law, but under grace. In other words, we don't have to be dominated by sin anymore. We don't have to be controlled by sin anymore. Not because of us, not because of our effort, but because of God's power, God's grace. We're set free. Those strongholds, one of these days, they'll be under your feet because they're already under his feet. Think about this. When you're battling with a sin that you haven't defeated yet, you are fighting for, against something that Jesus already died for. You are fighting against something that he already defeated. And I know Butch was sharing with a brother who struggles with alcoholism. He said, you know, it's God's will for you to be delivered from alcohol. And that's God's best. But even if you never quite get delivered, you're still a Christian. You're still a believer. And that sin's not going to heaven with you. <laughs> You will be free one of these days. And I hope I'm not mis misinterpreting what you said. Good. I got the thumbs up. Good. I don't want to ever misrepresent what somebody shared with another person. Um, all right. So, but that should encourage that person to know that, hey, you're loved because of what Jesus did for you, not because of what you did for him. And uh, so, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So we're called to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So in other words, one of the phrases that really helped me was, you can't stop the birds from flying, but you can stop them from building a nest. Think about that. What we, what, what we need to learn to do, you know when you get a crazy thought, like you open the Bible, and the enemy puts a blasphemous thought in your head. Yeah, I've been there. Just rebuke it. Just, you know, don't, don't let it obsess. A friend of mine, he used to drive double-decker buses. That would be terrorizing in and of itself. Um, he would open his Bible, and he would fall apart because whenever he opened his Bible, blasphemous thoughts filled his head, and he wouldn't tell anyone else. And he had a nervous breakdown. God built him back up again. But these things are real. And we need to be aware of brothers and sisters in Christ who might be struggling with stuff like this so that they can be aware that, because we don't really talk about this kind of stuff, um, that they're not alone. Other believers have gone through this. Well, what we like to say is, is if the enemy has accused you of blasphemy of the Spirit, don't worry, you've not committed it if you're worried about it. Let it go and learn that you can't stop the birds from flying. We all get weird thoughts in our head, don't we? Anyone else out there get weird thoughts in their head sometimes? 
Gordon, I would never have known. No. <laughs> but, but, when, but when that happens, we, we, we got to learn to laugh it off and give it to Jesus, right? right? Well, that was interesting. You know, don't let, don't let the enemy build a nest. And very often what will happen is, the enemy will put a thought in your head that you're afraid of. You'll obsess about it. And so you're completely focused by it. And so he's built, not only is he building a nest, he's, he's laid some eggs. And the chicks are getting ready to hatch, you know. <laughs> and it's going to be miserable in there. No, don't let fear do that to you. Don't let fear, as I said, now as a believer, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let the love of God rule your life and you don't need to be controlled anymore by these elements. A final word here, Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Testimonies are wonderful, but the final authority isn't my testimony, it's God's word, right? My testimony, I thank God for it and the Bible says we overcame him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb. Here's a thought. What does the blood of the Lamb do? The blood of the Lamb washes us from our sin. What does the enemy do? Reminds us of our sin. Accuses us. Does he accuse you ever, Butch, of, of something you've never done? Okay. But what I mean is, does he ever accuse you of something that's never been a weakness in your life? No. I mean... Wish I could come up with something that would be funny, but I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't off the top of my head. Um, yes. Oh, wow. That's sad when that happens. I think what's sad too is when sometimes uh, he even uses other believers to do that. It's like we're so ignorant sometimes of the warfare we're in. Even if what we say might be true, we're not called to accuse one another. We're called to pray for one another. We're called to help each other out. We're called to kind of like what um, Shem and Japheth did. They covered the nakedness of their father with the love of God, you know. Yeah, love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, that's our church scripture, isn't it? Because unless we love one another, we'd probably kill one another, wouldn't we? <laughs> Uh, you know, um, thank God for the love of God. I love you, Gordon. I love you. And hopefully you'll love me too. It keeps, I love you too, Terry. I even love you, even though I give you a hard time. Um, yeah. I even love my father-in-law, you know? I mean, he might be an in-law, but I still love him. We... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spo never a truer word spoken. Amen to that. Grace. And the love of God operates on grace, doesn't it? We don't operate in the love of God because we deserve it. Man, if we treated each other how we deserved, I wouldn't expect that much. But the love of God operates on grace. Grace is the, is the motivation behind the love of God. It's not, well, this brother has been really good to me, so I'm going to love him. No, we, we're called to love our enemy, even. Even the person who made that phone call. <laughs> um, Ephesians 6, let's, let's go there. Ephesians 6. Verse 16. Because of the nature of my testimony, I don't try to go into excessive detail, if that makes sense. I don't want to. But sometimes there is a need to go into a bit of detail just to let you know that there is deliverance. Um, but Ephesians 6.16 6, says, Above all, taking the shield of faith. Trust Him. Trust God with what you're going through. Trust God when those voices come against you. Trust Him. It operates like a shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. 
is probably the last scripture we're going to read here tonight, but we've all watched those movies with fiery darts, right? When they light the arrows, why do they put fire on the arrow? When they shoot it out, it's to cause a fire on the other side, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, it makes, makes sense. Um, and the Apostle Paul here is using a worldly analogy to describe a spiritual warfare that the enemy does. The enemy will give suggestion. Not all of us hear voices. Some of us, unfortunately, have suffered with that reality. But you will get suggestion sometimes in your mind. And um, what the enemy does, he fires fiery darts. In other words, when he fires a suggestion, it's to light a fire in your head. Um, I'll share this, even though I feel vulnerable about sharing it, because I don't want to be misunderstood. And if it's too graphic, forgive me, please. But I had massive headaches before I went to church. And even after being a believer, I had massive headaches. And those headaches were caused because I had visions of my brain exploding. <laughs> I know it sounds terrible. And the enemy, when he would threaten to kill me, the, the voice would come to me and said, if, if, if you don't quit reading the Bible, I'm going to blow your brains out. And I believe that the enemy had the power to do that. And I suffered tremendously with awful headaches. And sometimes I'd be in a crowd and I'd just go, ah, like that. And people would look at you and move away from you, you know. Because I thought, well, there's a crazy dude. Get away from him. But one day, I'm kind of slow on the uptake. But after going through this for about four months, yeah, I'm kind of slow. It dawned on me, the enemy doesn't have the power to do this. If he did, he would have done it a long time ago. And then it dawned on me, it's like, it's a thought. And because I believed it, it's controlled my life. And as soon as I began to realize, and I believe it was because of the light of reading God's truth, the um, dot, it was like a dark thing in my head. And it began to shrivel up, you know, in size to a tiny little pea in my head. And it, and it lost its footing. And I can remember rejoicing. I had been liberated. The Bible says you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And oh, I tell you what, the headaches left. I, I was set free. And I could read my Bible now without the fear of the enemy yelling and screaming at me because I realized he didn't have the power to do what he claimed. And that's why I said a lie only has power over your life if you believe it. But how do you break lies? You break lies with the truth of God's word. And my friends, that doesn't happen instantly. I've tried over the years to minister to people because as soon as people hear my testimony, they want me you know, to share with other people who, have gone, who are going through voices and stuff like that. Um, some people want a very quick fix. And it doesn't always happen quickly. It happens by degrees. So please be encouraged. It's better sometimes that God does it by degrees because then it's more permanent and lasting. For me, it was instant and by degrees, if that makes sense. It was both. I had that wow moment where God poured his love, where I believe that's where I got saved as well. But then I had the discipling moments where I needed to renew my mind with God's word. I do have one more verse, then we'll close. Romans 12. Turn with me there. Romans 12. Romans 12. And verse 2. Some people want instant deliverance, and therefore they're never free. Some people aren't willing to really seek after the Lord for freedom. And, you know, not just to get set free, but to live a life for God. Um, but here, Romans 12, I'll read verse 1 as well, because your body belongs to God. You belong to God. Romans 12 tells us to do this. Even if you've done this, it's time to do it again. In your heart tonight, give yourself to God. Right now, in your heart of hearts, 
He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So God's mercies, which are multiple, give us the courage and the confidence to do this. To present your bodies. Do that tonight. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship or your reasonable act of worship. Now notice the second part. Do not be conformed to this world. To be conformed means to be molded. To be molded by the pattern of this world. And it's in your mind where that happens. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's continuous tense. Be being transformed, but be being transformed and it's the Greek word metamorphosis from which the caterpillar and the butterfly, we've all heard that one, haven't we? Um, be, be metamorphosized, basically. Be being transformed by the renewal or the renewing of your mind. That, my friend, takes place when we read the Bible. We meditate on the Scripture. We fill our mind with God's Word. Um, we fill our minds with beautiful psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. It's time for us to feed on spiritual things. If we want to be delivered from the powers of darkness, we fill our lives with the things of God. And we get serious about it. You know, we were committed to our sins in the past. All addictions are basically a replacement because you're wired to worship, but you're worshiping the wrong things. You're worshiping that drug, or you're worshiping that alcohol, or you're worshiping that lust, whatever it is. Instead of worshiping God, you have been created to worship God. And if you don't worship God, you'll worship something else. And whatever you worship, you obsess about. And so it's time for us to Worship God. That's how we're set free from addictive lives in those bad things. Because that void in your life that you're trying to fill with all these other addictions can only be filled by God. Only God can satisfy the human soul. You were made for God. Let's live for God. That, you, um, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. So with that, I will close, but hopefully it may bring some encouragement to you guys out there. I know we all have different types of testimonies. Some of us were raised in church all our life. Hallelujah. Um, not all testimonies have to be like mine. Thank God. <laughs> Amen. Um, everyone's testimony is a little different. The important thing is, is that we, we've been saved by Jesus Christ, you know, whatever route we've been on. Um, every, every testimony, every salvation experience is unique, but it's the same Jesus that saves the same person. And that's why we have fellowship tonight, is because you and I are worshiping the same Jesus Christ, and we want to know him more. Amen? As we close here, any thoughts, any questions that you want? We don't mind questions. It's okay. You're okay? All right. Well, let's stand and let's pray, guys, shall we? And uh, Father, we do thank you tonight in the name of Jesus for your salvation to us all. Father, I know I had the privilege of sharing my testimony, but I know the testimonies in this room are filled with examples of how you, by your grace, got a hold of each one of us. Father, we're so blessed. We're so grateful for the new birth. And Father, we pray, help us tonight in our struggles. Help us to encourage one another daily as we see the day of your return approaching. Let each of us know here that none of us are alone, but we're a part of the family of God and that we're not struggling by ourselves. Father, may you graciously use my testimony to encourage others and to uplift others and to give others hope.
that uh, no matter how lost we are, no matter how in bondage we are, you can break the deepest bondage. We thank you tonight for your love to us and for sending your only son. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. God bless.